Hello, and welcome back to New Scientist Weekly, your curated selection of the week's science stories. I'm Christy Taylor in New York. And I'm Timothy Revel, also in New York. This week on the pod, we'll be catching up on Neuralink's big ambitions for brain implants, now with a human trialling the technology. Plus, how avoiding climate warming contrails caused by planes could be as easy as flying a little higher or lower. And the tiny tornadoes inside some animal cells. Don't worry, though. These itty-bitty tornadoes seem to be crucial to life as opposed to forces of destruction. But first... Earlier this week, new research found that a small handful of people developed Alzheimer's disease decades after receiving a treatment for childhood growth issues. The implication is that in very rare cases, Alzheimer's disease could theoretically be transmitted from person to person during medical procedures. But there's still a lot we don't know. Our reporter Chen Lai has the full story. Hey, Chen. Hello. So, Chen, the idea of a transmissible form of Alzheimer's disease understandably sounds pretty alarming, but what's actually going on here? Yeah, you're right. It does sound alarming, but it's definitely not a cause for concern. Let me start with some context. So from the late 1950s to the mid 1980s, thousands of children around the world who had growth issues such as short stature or growth hormone deficiency were treated with injections of human growth hormones extracted from the pituitary glands in the brains of cadavers. However, the approach was banned pretty promptly in 1985 after some people who received the treatment died from a rare neurodegenerative condition called creutzfeldt jakob disease. It turned out those people had received hormones that had been contaminated with misfolded proteins called prions, which cause progressive and irreparable damage to the brain. We already knew then that some people received contaminated batches of growth hormones that then led to this different condition. Take us back to Alzheimer's disease. How do they link up? Right. So much like prion-related conditions like creutzfeldt jakob disease, a key hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is the buildup of other misfolded proteins in the brain called amyloid beta and tau. In the UK, it was found that some people who had received these donated human growth hormones received injections that were contaminated with traces of that amyloid beta So in this latest study, researchers reviewed the cases of eight people who received this contaminated batch as children and found that five of them were already diagnosed or met the diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease. And of the remaining three, two experienced cognitive impairments and one was asymptomatic. Do the researchers think that these amyloid beta contaminated batches actually cause the Alzheimer's disease? How can we be sure that they didn't just develop it because of genetics or any other risk factors? That's a really great question and a very important distinction. So as part of the study, the researchers conducted DNA analysis of five of the eight people and found that none of them were genetically predisposed to having any neurodegenerative conditions. They also explore the idea of other alternative explanations. So for example, two of the eight had an intellectual disability, which has been linked to a higher chance of dementia, or it could have been as a result of their childhood growth issues. Because it was a small sample, it's not entirely possible to rule out these explanations. But of the people they regularly review as part of the National Prion Monitoring Cohort in the UK, which look at people who have received the treatment and report cognitive issues, the vast majority are those who receive the contaminated growth hormone batches. This led to the researchers to see this transmitted Alzheimer's as the most plausible explanation. So what does this mean more broadly? Are there any other contexts in which Alzheimer's could be transmissible? And is that something we should be worried about? Not at all. So the researchers say that there's no suggestion that Alzheimer's can be transmitted when you're in close contact with people with Alzheimer's or in routine medical procedures where strict hygiene and safety measures are already in place. But people who did receive the cadaveric human growth hormone should seek help if they feel that they need it. It's also important to stress that this form of treatment was banned in the 80s, so even as a potential route of Alzheimer's transmission, it's no longer relevant to the general population. Moving on to other brain news, this week we heard from Elon Musk that his brain-computer interface company Neuralink has carried out its first human trials. Technology reporter Matthew Sparks joins us from London. Hi, Matt. Hello there. So, Matt, can you remind us what is Neuralink and what are they actually trying to build and do? So Neuralink, like you say, it's a 
company that's working on a brain computer interface and that is basically a device the size of a coin which gets fitted inside the skull and then tiny wires branch off from that and and sort of reach into the brain by a few millimeters the idea is basically that it can pick up on neuron activity and interpret those brain waves so in a in a really crude way it's uh, reading your mind why might I want one of these? Is there any reason I should let Elon Musk directly into my head? <laughs> <laughs> well, Neuralink says the signals that the device reads off your brain can be interpreted by a, a smartphone or a computer, and you'll be able to control it by thought alone. So, you know, your computer will be able to send messages directly into your brain, and you will be able to think and control those computers. So it could be useful in all sorts of ways. For someone who is paralyzed, they could use it to talk to a computer or through a computer faster and more naturally than current devices allow. It could also allow you to do Google searches uh, just by thought or even send messages to other people who've got a Neuralink fitted, which, if you think about it, is basically technological telepathy. So Neuralink, you know, as Tim mentioned, I mean, it has the Elon Musk brand all over it. It seems to get a lot of attention for that reason. But is this the first trial of this sort of technology in humans? No, not not by a long way. There's a, a lot of academic groups and commercial startups already running human trials and succeeding in interpreting brain signals into some kind of output. You can really go back a couple of decades and see people working on this. One case I wrote about back in 2021 involved a team at Stanford University placing two small sensors just under the surface of the brain of a man who was paralyzed below the neck. And when they asked that man to think about writing words on paper with a pen, which he's obviously not able to do anymore physically, they were able to capture those brainwaves and decode them into readable text. Yeah, that sounds really amazing. And it also very much seems like there are benefits both to assist people with disabilities and restore senses or motion to people, but also to augment our abilities in new ways. But is it safe? I mean, we're talking about brains here. Yeah, that's that's basically what Neuralink wants to find out about this device with this trial. This sort of thing has been done before, but like you say, it's still it's still brains. It's invasive brain surgery, so it's it's not to be taken lightly. Yeah, that that seems like a particularly crucial point and one that's a bit at odds with Musk often pitching this as a consumer technology device. Is this really a medical product or could it really be a gadget? From what Musk has said, this this is eventually going to be a consumer device, which probably makes it more interesting than than the rest of the crowd of competitors because they normally pitch it as a, as a medical implant. But whether people will be willing or even allowed to go through a process like that just for some sort of telepathic link with their phone, it's not clear. You can certainly see the potential benefits, but it's a, it's a pretty serious decision to go through brain surgery for a gadget. And even if it's allowed by regulators and wanted by consumers, then it's also likely to be extremely expensive. So we'll see. M- Musk says the product's going to be called telepathy, and it will provide a link to your smartphone or computer. But Musk has a bit of a history of overpromising when it comes to new products. Culture Lab is out, and you don't want to miss it. TV columnist Bethan Ackerley is in conversation with the explorer and documentary maker Simon Reeve. It's a wonderful talk all about his new series, Wilderness, the wonder of our planet's most dramatic landscapes, and how indigenous peoples are sustainably managing land even in some of the most remote places on Earth. And one more thing, we've got a special offer on digital subscriptions for podcast listeners at the moment. For just one US dollar or British pound per week, you can gain full access to our articles, both present and past. Just go over to newscientist.com slash podcasts to get started. Good news is always welcome in the story of our rapidly warming planet. And James Deneen, good news, wrote about some this week. Hi, James. Howdy. Okay, so while flying in an airplane is one of the big things we should all be doing less of to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you have a story about how companies could reduce the climate impact of contrails. Those are those streams of white vapor that form behind planes in the sky. For starters, James, why are contrails a big deal for the climate? So as you said, Flying in planes is not great for the climate, and that's true. Burning jet fuel is responsible for a little over 2% of global carbon dioxide emissions, and that share is growing both as more people fly and as other industries get greener. What you might not know, though, is that most of the climate impact of flying actually comes from so-called non-CO2 effects, such as the warming effect of water vapor and soot injected into the atmosphere. And contrails 
are one of the most visible of those non-CO2 effects. By some estimates, the heat trapped in the atmosphere by contrails drives as much warming as half of the CO2 emissions from aviation. So contrails are a problem for the climate. So how do contrails form in the first place? I definitely have noticed that they seem to vary a lot in terms of how noticeable they are. Is that related? Yeah, so a lot of it has to do with weather conditions high in the atmosphere. Contrails appear when water vapor and soot are injected into frigid, humid conditions. This saturates the air with water vapor, which appears as those streaks overhead. Some of those don't last very long, and those ones don't have much of an effect on the climate. But even when you account for the sunlight that these contrail clouds reflect away from the planet, the persistent contrails have a net warming effect. And one, one interesting consequence of this is that contrails that form at night actually have a much greater warming effect than those formed during the day because they don't reflect sunlight. So there's another reason to avoid the red eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I personally don't need another reason to avoid those flights. So contrails warm the atmosphere, but you've also reported that they can be avoided. How so? Yes. So there's been a lot of attention recently on what are called altitude diversions. The idea is to forecast those frigid, humid atmospheric conditions that form contrails and then change flight paths so planes don't fly through them. A few airlines have actually started testing this out and have reported some pretty promising results. That sounds simple enough, but it's also giving me the vibes of this one easy trick will solve all your problems, which often turns out not to be the case. So what's the catch? Is there one? Well, there are lots of practical questions remaining about this idea. For instance, some researchers say that contrail forecasts are not accurate enough yet to reliably say where a contrail would or wouldn't form. And changing altitude might also require more fuel, leading to more emissions that offset the benefit of avoided contrails. So there's that. And there are also questions about how all of this would affect air traffic. But to address some of those practical questions, a group of researchers at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands used public data on nearly 6 million flights, along with measurements of temperature and humidity from a global network of weather balloons, to model how flight paths would have to change to avoid those contrail forming conditions. And they actually found that much of the time, avoiding the contrails would only require changing altitude by just a few hundred meters. This type of maneuver is already common in air traffic control. And they found it wouldn't take much extra fuel. So it's a vote of confidence for using altitude diversions to avoid contrails, which could turn out to be one of the quickest ways to reduce the climate impacts of flying. Now we move from the dynamics of gas in our atmosphere on planet-wide scales to the very microscopic. It turns out the dynamics of what's happening inside cells can be quite similar to the way weather churns air. And that could be crucial for how cells survive. Alex Wilkins is here to explain it all. Hi, Alex. Hello. I have to say this is quite a weird one to think about. I mean, how can a cell be like a weather system? Yeah, it's not the most intuitive comparison, but... Everyone's really familiar with kind of tornadoes and twisters in storms being agents of extreme destruction. But if you look at cells that are very, very small, we're talking 0.1 millimeters across, it turns out there are some very similar effects taking place. So we've known for more than 100 years that the movement of cytoplasm, this jelly-like internal material in a cell, is important for cell survival and its development. But we've now seen a really distinct form of this movement. We've seen tiny twisters, like those tornadoes I was referring to earlier, in fruit fly egg cells. And these cells, which scientists observe with a really powerful microscope, appear to be circulating the cytoplasm around a central point over several minutes, just like a tornado circulates air or water circles a drain. That's quite weird to think about. How do the, these tornadoes actually form? Presumably it's, it's not the same way that a tornado forms in the atmosphere. No, you're right, it's not. So the, the researchers suspected that it had something to do with these things called microtubules, which are these proteins shaped a little bit like bendy straws, and there are thousands of them embedded in the cell's outer membrane. And you also have these tiny motor proteins that climb along the microtubules to transport cargo around the cell. And the researchers thought there might be some interaction with the motor proteins flattening the microtubules and, and, and that having an effect. So they use these really powerful computer simulations to model the microtubules and the motor proteins together and what effect they might have on the cell's fluid. 
And they found that they could really closely reproduce patterns that they found when observing the cells in real life with the microscopes. And basically what's happening is the motor proteins climb along the microtubules in one direction, flattening them, causing fluid to flow against them, flattening them even more, and voila, you have a tornado. That's amazing. And you mentioned that this isn't just some fun process, but it's actually possibly essential to life. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, so to properly grow and divide, egg cells need to have a stage where they distribute and mix their different cellular ingredients together before later they then cement and settle these elements in place. These twisters seem to be an essential part of this early mixing stage, without which the cell wouldn't have the energy and ingredients it needs to divide. So tornadoes, you could say, seem to be an essential part for at least some forms of life. And is it limited to just fruit fly eggs or do we have tornadoes in our own cells? So the fun news is it's probably not limited to fruit fly eggs. Any cell that is as large as a fruit fly egg could have a cellular vortex or tornado, though there might not be that many of them as these cells are quite large compared to others. But maybe other egg cells like in frogs or small mammals could display these effects. If you're wondering whether they're inside our own cells, human cells are all much smaller than the fruit fly egg. Even a human egg cell, which is the largest cell in a human body, is much, much smaller than this fruit fly egg. And the researchers told me it's unlikely this effect will be taking place there because of the different dynamics of the cytoplasm in much smaller cells. Christy, what do dogs need to live a long life? Is, it, is this a trick question? I mean, long walks, treats, snuggles, games of fetch, to be told that they're very, very good? <laughs> I mean, almost certainly all of those things, but also perhaps a long nose and a modest stature. They might be the key ingredients to a long canine life. At least that's what research looking at the median lifespan of 50,000 dogs in the UK found. So when I'm thinking about dogs then that, that match that, you know, small body, long nose, I'm thinking like whippets, dachshunds, like little ones, maybe like a Shetland sheepdog. Does that mean big dogs with small noses had the shortest lives? Um, not quite. You're right about those small dogs with long noses. But the shortest lived were actually just medium sized dogs, this time the short nosed ones. So think like an English bulldog. And the difference was fairly significant. So the longest lived dogs had a median lifespan of over 13 years. But the shortest lived dogs, meanwhile, lived to somewhere between nine and a half to 10 years. So quite a big difference. And maybe surprisingly, purebred dogs seem to live longer than those categorized as crossbreeds, though that category included both designer crossbreeds like Labradoodles and your typical assorted mutt. Huh. I would actually be very interested to see a breakdown of that group in future research because those are some very different things to include in the same category. Yeah, the research team also want to do that split. And they say that knowing this kind of data might help further research pinpoint ways to help the health and longevity of dogs most at risk of an early death. Got it. OK, well, let's do a quick update on the Chinese spy balloon that took the U.S. and Canada by storm last year, shall we? <laughs> Is it back? No, it's not back. But a team of researchers would like us to know that that month where it was all over the news, while China was busy claiming it was a weather balloon, a lot of bots on social media were trying to tell us the same thing. In fact, bots using the hashtags Chinese balloon and weather balloon sent out tens of thousands of tweets on the site formerly known as Twitter between late January and late February last year. And how do we know these tweets were from bots? Well, there are a couple key tells that a Twitter account's posts are, quote, bot-like activity. One is just if they're being sent out too quickly for a human typing on a keyboard. So, you know, fractions of a second apart, for example. Another is if their geolocation tags switch around really implausibly. You're in London one minute, Buenos Aires the next, New Zealand the next. Mm. Uh, not possible. But more interestingly... The bot activity did seem to vary based on what country the users purported to be in. So of tweets based in the United States, about a third were from bots. Of tweets based in China, two-thirds were from bots. And of tweets allegedly from neither country, about 40 percent were deemed by the research team to be bots. I feel like the takeaway here is a familiar one. Always be sceptical of what you see on social media, especially if it's something that people feel strongly about. This is one of my top 10 rules for life, Tim. <laughs> OK, one last story for you about a cool gadget that could help you turn fibres into rope if you were living 37,000 years ago. 
So this is all about a carved piece of mammoth ivory that was found in a cave in Germany. It's about 21 centimetres or 8 inches long, with four carved holes in it and spiral grooves at one end. And originally, archaeologists thought it was a piece of jewellery or maybe it was something to do with art. But upon a closer look, there were plant fibres in some of the grooves. So researchers did what you do. They made a replica and then they started feeding strands of different fibres through the grooves to see if it could be used to make a rope. That whole make a replica and cosplay as ancient humans research field is just so wildly fascinating to me. How did the rope making go? I would like to know if they also dressed up whilst (laughs) testing this for sure. Well, they tried a number of things, including deer, sinew and flax, but the tools seemed to work best when you used cattail fibre, also known as bulrushes. And it takes one person to hold the tool and then another person per strand that you're feeding in at a time. So four, maybe five people. But they were able to make five metres of rope this way in just 10 minutes. And they think that experienced rope makers would be able to do the same thing, but much more quickly and efficiently. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. You can find all the stories we talked about today in the show notes, and you can subscribe to this podcast on whichever app you're currently listening on. Plus, if you like the great stories we're bringing you, please give us a rating or review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It really helps us to get to more people. We'll be back next week, but that's bye for now. Bye. This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.